So far we've just been considering symbol codes in which given a sequence of source symbols x1 up to xn say, we encoded this by concatenating a sequence of code words cx1 up to cxn. But this is a very restricted sort of code. And one problem which can arise with this is that there are certain inefficiencies that arise from the fact that each code word has to have an integer valued length. So when we saw the, the upper and lower bounds on the expected code word length, we saw that, that it ha was lower bounded by the entropy and it was upper bounded by the entropy plus one. And it turns out that even for an optimal symbol code for a given source, the expected code word length can be arbitrarily close to this upper bound. So for example, if you were doing a binary encoding, if, it, if B was two, then you could have up to one bit you could fail to be to reach this ideal limit by up to one bit per code word. And so since you have n code words here that you're stringing together, then your total encoded length could fail to reach this ideal lower limit by up to n bits in a binary encoding. So one way to address this is using is using block codes and the idea of block codes. So I'm going to denote these x1 to xn by a sequence of dots here, say nine little dots. The idea behind block coding is that maybe we can take that, that up to one bit of inefficiency and spread it out over, over a few different source symbols. So we could maybe spread it out over, say, in this case, maybe like three source symbols. So we could have block sizes of, of length three and so on. And you would have a sequence then of blocks instead of a sequence. So for each block, you would have a code word rather than having for each source symbol a code word. So this is the idea behind block coding. And you can, and you can in fact, you can in fact remove that inefficiency by using this type of method. So let's think about how we can generalize our, our present situation to this, to this situation of using blocks. So, so far we've been talking about just having a, a code from our source alphabet X to sequences of encoded strings, sequences from our code alphabet, and this X was our source alphabet. And we had a random variable X for our source distributed according to PMFP, and X was a discrete random variable. So for a discrete memory list source, we would have a sequence X1, X2, and so on that were IID distributed according to P. And then we defined for this code, the expected code word length. Now, let's think about the situation of blocks. So say we have blocks of length. So here, this would maybe, this would, if we call the length of the block K, this would be the case of K equals three. So let's think about encoding sequences of blocks or sequences of source symbols in, in blocks. Now, if we have K equals three, then we would have sequences like this first one here would be like X1, X2, X3. And this sequence, this little sequence right here belongs to our original source alphabet to the three or to the K more generally. So this would be a, this would be a code from X to the K to encoded strings. And so in this situation, our, our, the corresponding thing is X to the K. Maybe I'll denote this C by something else here. Maybe I'll call it C to the K to distinguish it from the original C. And then we're gonna have some corresponding thing here. What are we going to have for the, the random variable now? Well, it's going to be a sequence. Maybe it's, I'll denote X subscript one to K now we're encoding this sequence of random variables, x1 up to xk, this little block of random variables. And the distribution of this, these, are go these guys are going to have some joint distribution. Maybe I'll, I'll call it p to the k. That's not, not p to the kth power. This is just notation to denote that it's corresponding to a block of length k. And what is this p to the k? Well, it, it's for the case of a discrete memory list source, these guys are going to be IID drawn from P, the same P. So this is just, th just going to factor, right? It's just the joint distribution of 
x1 to k is px1 times px2 up to pxk. And this is the same little p as up here, and that's because these guys, these are iid. Now, what is the corresponding thing to L? Well, there's going to be some expected length of these the encoded sequences here. We have some distribution over x1 through k, and we're mapping that to sequences of, of encoded symbols, of code symbols. So there's going to be some expected code word length for this guy, and let's call it maybe L to the k in parentheses, so it doesn't look like, like this L to the k. And this, of course, is just just the natural extension. This one, remember, this one was the sum over all x's, the length of x times p of x, which is, of course, just the expected value of the length of x, the length of the code word associated with this x. And the corresponding thing here is, of course, just the sum over all sequences, x1 to k, of the length under this code of that sequence, maybe I'll call it L to the K, times the probability of that sequence under this joint distribution, which is this factorization. And this is, of course, just the expected value of the length of the random sequence, the length of the code word associated with the random sequence X1 to K. Now, at this point, you might be saying to yourself, hey, you know, this really is looking a lot, this more supposedly more general thing of encoding these blocks is really looking a lot like this original case with just a little bit of different notation. And if you think about it for a second, actually, it's really, it, this just reduces to this original case because we can think about it in the following way. We can think about just take, take x, you know, maybe we call it x prime to be this x to the k and take, you know, then th th we were, we'll now be thinking about this x to the k as our source alphabet rather than our source alphabet multiplied k times. So just think about this as our source alphabet and think about this as our random variable. We're going to have sequences of these little blocks and think about maybe we just call it p prime for pk. And so really, this is all just exactly the same as the original case that we were thinking about. So just think about a block of symbols as itself being a source symbol in our new sort of situation. And the, one of the requirements that we had for our original thing was unique decodability and prefix codes and all of that stuff. And all of exactly the same things apply in this more in this this block case because you know we're gonna have sequences of blocks and we need for the extension of this guy to be to be one to one in order for us to be able to string together the code words and and still have it be decodable, uniquely decodable and everything. So dealing with these blocks is really essential it's basically exactly the same as in the original case. All of our theory, all of the things that we proved about that original case carry over directly to the case of blocks. Now one thing which is which we should be a little bit careful about is distinguishing between this L to the K and L. So we, what we would like to be able to do is to compare so our original what was our original motivation here up here for doing blocks was that we wanted to get lower expected code word length or we we wanted to get shorter messages on average is what we really wanted and so how are we going to what would be the appropriate way to compare the performance of a block code with a just a regular old you know symbol code where it was like you could think of this as actually just block length of one you know you could put like one here you know so that that's that would just this would just be a special case of this in that sense so what's the appropriate way to compare these? Well, if you think about what we were doing here, we said this L is our expected code word length. And this was when we were encoding one symbol at a time from X. 
Or in other words, you could say it was our expected encoded length per source symbol, right? Expected coded encoded length per source symbol. Because, you know, we were just taking one source symbol at a time. But now in this situation, when we're doing blocks, the appropriate comparison would be to compare the expected encoded length per source symbol. Because, you know, we're going to take a given source like this, and maybe we have n source symbols, and we're going to encode it. And we'd like to compare the total, you know, on average, the total encoded length to the original length. And so the appropriate thing would be to compare the expected encoded length per source symbol. But that's not what this L to the K is. This is the expected encoded length per K source symbols for every K source symbols. So if we need to, if we're going to compare this to this, what we need to do is divide it by K. So that would give us our expected. So we could say expected encoded length per source symbol is L to the K divided by K. And let's give that a name. Let's call that L sub K for a given block code CK. So we use the K just to distinguish it from this original L. So L superscript K is the expected code word length for the block code. And I'm going to use L subscript K for the expected encoded length per source symbol. Okay, now one more thing I would like to mention in this video is that for our original situation here, we had our upper and lower bounds, which I wrote right here. Maybe I'll, I'll rewrite them a little more explicitly with the P's. We had that the entropy is a lower bound on our expected code word length, which was less than the entropy plus one. And since this, you know, it's thinking about this in this, this uh, as a special case of the first one, the block code is a special case. We have the same exact result. We have the same result as this. But we just have to replace the, you know, P with P prime and, and uh, so forth. So we would get, we would get that the entropy of P to the K is less or equal to the expected code word length here, L to the K, L or LK, and that's upper bounded by the entropy of the, the joint distribution plus one. And of course, all these entropies are, you know, base B, whatever base you happen to be working with. Okay. So this is going to be essential in our proof of the source coding theorem. But before we get to that, we need to do one little calculation involving computing this entropy. So let's do that next.